So welcome to Union Chapel. I, I hope you've had the opportunity to see the film, The Race to Save the World. And we're, we're very grateful for the filmmaker, Joe Gantz, for the opportunity to show this as our contribution to Earth Day. But I'm also very pleased to introduce to you a very special guest who will help us reflect further on the film and its implications. My guest is Danny Sreeskandaraja. Danny is the CEO of Oxfam GB, and he, he comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience, not only of development, but also migration, and perhaps most importantly for today's discussion on the role of civil society in bringing about change. Before joining Oxfam, he was the Secretary General of Civicus. So Danny, welcome, and uh, thank you for, thank you, for being here. I, I wonder what your first thoughts were when you saw the film, particularly about the the people that we we saw there. Thank you for, for having me and thank you for uh, giving me the privilege of watching the film as well. I, I found it really inspiring, um, particularly because it was this notion of, of sort of everyday activism brought to life so wonderfully in the, in the stories that the film talks about. That, you know, I've, I've always held this belief that, you know, there isn't much different between any one of us and those incredible figures in, in history or even in contemporary life that have changed the world, you know, whether it's a Gandhi or a Greta Thunberg, um, there, you know, all of these people in some ways are ordinary people, if you will, who have done extraordinary things. And, and for me, what was really powerful about this film was, was this idea that, you know, I think all of the characters, if you will, um, didn't really intend to get into the things that they did, but in their own way, just managed to do these profound and profoundly important things during the course of that sort of everyday activism, if you will. Um, and I, for me, just to, I, mean, I you know that I, I lived in South Africa for a while, and I remember this sort of fantastic image of, of Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi lived, as many people know, in South Africa. He was a lawyer was by no means an activist. And there's this fantastic um, uh, uh, image of uh, Gandhi outside a mosque in Johannesburg um, where he committed his first act of civil disobedience. And it was basically ripping up her passbook that was being uh, asked of, of, of all people of color in South Africa to, carry, to, 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 to have carried. And you know, by all accounts that I've read, I never intended to be a sort of a leader of, of, of activism in the way that he did, but it was that small act uh, of, of, of frustration with the oppression of the, of, of the state that hadn't even become the full-blown apartheid state that led him to do all sorts of other things. And I, I just kept thinking of that image when I was watching this film, that each of these people in some ways were, um, were doing, you know, playing their part in, in that sort of uh, everyday activism. Taking one step and then finding they're being drawn into the next and the next and the next and not and not actually giving up, uh, seeing it right through until the to, to the end. They were carrying the world on their shoulders, you know. And people who are in the struggle, uh, who are activists for for social change, also have lives, you know, and families. Um, were they carrying too much on their shoulders? I don't know. And you could see in the film the price that each of them and their families and, and loved ones were paying. And it's not something I can uh, sort of comment on, but I do think that the power of, of civic action, for me, in part, comes from its diversity. You know, each of us can play our role in the things, in the struggles that matter to us to the extent we want to in some ways, right? And I, I think it would be unfair, unreasonable to each, to expect every person who cares about climate change, for example, um, to exhibit the sort of levels of, of self-sacrifice that many people on the film were showing. Uh, we, I don't think all of us would be prepared for that and it would be unfair to expect us to do that. But, but what's really powerful is that I hope that each of us can be inspired just to play our respective roles. and. You know, something like tackling climate breakdown and the climate crisis, I think, is such a, a sort of, well, it's the most palpable example of, of, a, of a struggle in which we are all 
intimately involved. You know, all seven odd billion of us on the planet need to be playing our part. Now, there are some incredibly brave activists who are who are doing the sort of things we saw in the film, who are getting arrested, who are being sent to prison. Um, and I hope that some of us play, you know, are brave and do courageous things that step out of our comfort zone, take risks uh, on our collective behalf. But we have to expect that not everyone's going to be able to do that. And, and I think, you know, one of the things we have to do is find ways for every one of us to play our role and lower the threshold, if you will, for us all to play a part. Uh, one of the things we at Oxfam are involved in is a campaign called Make My Money Matter. And it's a, it's a group of people, activists, corporates and others who are, um, are trying to get pension funds to play a far more activist role in a greener and more sustainable future. You know, I thought I thought it's another example of something as, as sort of relatively small, if you will, as, as moving your own pension money to a fund that's more activist is a relatively, you know, it's a tiny example of, of something you can do, comes at all, almost no risks. And in fact, the way that, that, you know, green investments are working at the moment, it can come with quite high rewards. But it's a sort of contrast, if you will, on that spectrum from sort of activism, which might get you arrested uh, and put in prison, all the way to the sort of doing the small things. And I think that's, to me, um, part of that uh, changing equation, if you will, in which each of us has to work out, you know, what's what are we going to put in in terms of, of raising our, our sort of collective action, collective ambition on the climate agenda in particular, right, on all sorts of other progressive causes, I think, in the world? To what extent do you think that these kind of big actions that have taken place, direct actions, which are, as you can see in the film, very costly in the lives of the people, they're also very dramatic and they're also a good bit of political theatre, if you like, I mean, as is Extinction Rebellion and so on, do they shift the agenda so that the, the sort of softer end, if you like, are somehow or other pressurised a little bit into taking action? Do they, if they weren't doing that, would the, the softer things be happening? Would, would the people who just recycled their, their rubbish and so on be as aware? Is there a, a cause effect? Yes. Yes, I do think that. I think that history has shown us that those big dramatic moments, often involving direct action, uh, civil disobedience, for example, have been, um, you know, really important turning points, if you will, or have been important maturation points, I suppose, in, in, in progressive struggles. So, you know, it's Martin Luther King marching or Rosa Parks not sitting, you know, sitting in a, in a bus seat or, um, uh, you know, or a range of contemporary actions, you know, Occupy Wall Street, mm. uh, the women's marches around the world, mm. the, the pipeline protests that we saw, the mm. school children going out in, in the last couple of years um, to protest climate breakdown. You know, all of these, I think, have are powerful ways of, of getting traction in, in media and social media. But really, I think importantly, as you say, or as you hint, um, driving the whole thing forward a little bit further, that creating uh, a, a new normal in which there's a sort of greater pressure on policymakers, on corporates and others to act, inspiring a whole range of others who may not be as aware of these issues. Um, and in fact, you know, for, for someone who's worked almost entirely in, uh, in my career in inside civil society organizations, um, in many cases, these actions also evolving into the sort of civil society organizations and institutions that we've come to love and respect. I mean, if you take Oxfam, for example, we've been around for almost 80 years. We have operations in 90 countries. I think we have 10,000 people around the world who work for Oxfam. But it all began uh, in the basement of the University Church in Oxford when eight ordinary citizens came together to protest what they thought um, was uh, sort of inhumane action by the British government and the allies to blockade Nazi occupied Greece and cause a famine that was breaking out in, in, in Greece. And that's why the Oxford Committee on Famine Relief, now called Oxfam, came into being. And, you know, and really importantly, they, you know, we, we often associate Oxfam with, with raising resources and funds 
to provide relief. And they did that. They, ra- they did a fundraising campaign and they raised money and it went to provide food relief behind uh, the, the uh, Allied lines in, 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 in Nazi-occupied Greece at the time. But importantly, they also wrote letters to, um, uh, to the Churchill government to cha- challenge the policy of, of total war, which was this idea that, you know, th- that you couldn't provide relief be- in Nazi-occupied areas because you'd effectively be subsidising the Nazi operations. And these people, and there were others around them across the country at the time, were considered, I'm told, uh, you know, idealists and naive and traitors by some, uh, and yet they stood up for these, you know, really powerful humanitarian uh, principles, but also importantly gave birth, if you will, to um, this incredibly important um, part of civil society. And it comes back to my point around diversity. You know, we need people who are prepared to take those risks, but we need every one of us to play small parts. We need that direct action, but we also need big institutions. And it's in that diversity, I think, that we, we that civil society thrives, where civic action has the most chance of succeeding. This, this film is set in the United States. Um, it's, a, uh, it's not a very diverse group of people, very, very committed group of people. Uh, so this isn't at all meant to be disparaging. But is there something that is missing in the film in terms of the same sort of civil society action, which is taking place outside of the Western Hemisphere, you know, and in, in, in contexts which are probably even more directly affected by climate change? I think... Um... I don't see it as what's missing in the film. I left uh, watching the film thinking how wonderful it would be to have the film replicated Mm. amongst other activist communities around the world. And as you mentioned at the start, I spent six years as Secretary General of Civicus, which is a a global civil society platform that has members in in 180 countries or so, you know, from small grassroots organisations all the way to the big, big NGOs. And One of the most inspiring things about those six years was meeting or interacting with activists all around the world. And, you know, what, you know, we live in a period of of lots of risks to progress on, on, on sort of civilizations. But we're also living in a period of of great um, activism, I think, you know, whether it's, I met some of the Pacific climate warriors who are these amazing people in the Pacific region who are who are standing up um, and uh, you know and and getting action and traction on uh, on on climate action in a, you know in a, in a part of the world that's already being affected by by climate change um, and you know there's this powerful image that will never go away in my mind which is of these people sitting on a canoe uh, with a big sign behind them saying we are not drowning we are fighting. And, you know, these are people who've, you know, in many parts of the Pacific, we're already seeing people having to move from low lying areas because of sea level rises. We are already seeing climate induced extreme weather events. In fact, Oxfam research recently showed that if you track the last decade or so, someone has had to move uh, or be displaced from their home every two seconds because of a, of a climate induced uh, extreme weather action. So. There are people like that who are doing those things. Or, you know, if you just think of the way that young people in particular are organising and mobilising and and achieving um, sort of dramatic ways of connecting. And as I talked about the climate marches of school children, but, you know, we can go back all the way back to the Arab revolutions about a decade ago. We can talk about um, the way that um, the internet is allowing people to come together um, and to connect in, in ways that, that they couldn't and it would have been more expensive and difficult to do, you know, as recently as a few years ago. And so I think the world over, we are seeing um, some, some very inspiring movements that are arising. In some ways, it's a tragedy because they, they're arising because of this period where you can feel there's a sort of, um, a, you know, the, where markets are failing to deliver sustainable and just outcomes where political systems be accountable to the people that they serve. And so it does feel like it's a period when we need that civic action uh, more than ever before. Um, 
and it's inspiring to see what's happening amongst these, you know, this group of people that were depicted so wonderfully mm. in the film. But for me, I, I've encountered people all around the world who are doing similarly brave, similarly remarkable things that we should all be inspired by. For me, the interesting question is how you, how you do sort of connect that up. You um, and I knew each other when I was working in practice and you were a, a board member. And one of the areas that we were very concerned about was Namibia in the period leading up to independence. There was a, a report on Sky News recently about oil exp explorations in the north of Namibia, which, if it goes ahead, would cause you know, enormous environmental damage, would impact on the indigenous sand peoples, affect the water supply in a pretty arid part of the, the world anyway. That comes to our attention what are the opportunities, the possibilities for solidarity in the sort of way in which we had solidarity during the anti-apartheid movement and in the lead up to independence and so on in that, in that earlier period? Well, I think your use of the word solidarity is, is spot on because for me, that is the, that's the word that often comes to mind when I think about, um, for example, the future of Oxfam. You know, we, we've just agreed a new strategic plan, which really is about building from below so that we're supporting and nurturing action close to the ground in the communities, if you will, that we work with, work with, but beyond borders, because this is a moment in which we do, on many issues, need global action and global solidarity. And I think that's, that, that feels a lot like how I've seen uh, the sort of anti-apartheid and, and sort of uh, the decolonizing movements of, mm. of, the, of the late 20th century, because it was based on those notions of solidarity that people stood together. And it feels particularly on climate or, or broader issues around resource exploitation, um, supply chains, that we do need to stand together once again. Um, and... I think that's there are some really powerful examples of, of how to do that. I, you know, one comes to mind recently when we had two um, amazing school children from Malawi, I, Isaac and Jesse, who joined us in the UK in 2019 at the height of some of those um, uh, student protests on climate change. And, you know, these were really articulate young people who were coming who are who living in communities that were already being affected by climate change and um you know what i still remember them being here and lots of british school children carrying pla placards that said you know save our future and jesse and jesse and isaac said well save our today because you know the impacts of climate change about which they had almost nothing to do with um you know are being felt by their communities in malawi and, and, and in many other parts of the world and I thought that was a powerful sort of manifestation of this importance of, of, of standing together or of solidarity. The, another, of course, is the fact that the way the global economy works means that we are so intimately bound up with each other in the way that money flows, cap, you know, capital, goods, services, people flow. Mm. And I think we have to really take seriously our mutual obligations. You know, it's not good enough any longer to to sort of consume, to extract, if you will, from, from people, communities and environments halfway around the world and ignore the impacts of your behavior, of your consumption on those people. And so I think we need to pay much more attention to supply chains, you know, we, you know, what lies behind that barcode, what happens in terms of human rights, of empowerment, of sustainability in those in those in, in the supply chain that leads to the sort of products and services that we consume, for example, here in the UK. And I think once you do that, it's almost like I think the sort of the discussions of the fair trade movement in the 1970s and 80s. Today, it's about really knowing the climate and human impacts of, of our behavior all around the world and, and building from that to deliver systemic change, because that's the other thing to me that, that's really important. Um, which is even even some of the direct actions that we saw in the um, in the film, uh, uh, you know, they're powerful moments of civil disobedience of people protesting of playing their part, 
but they talk to something bigger, which is the systemic change that we need if we are to have any chance of delivering a more just and sustainable future. And I think there is a lesson in there for all of us that you know this is a moment I think in human history where we need to deliver that sort of radical systemic change, for example, in the way the global economy works um, and you know how social protection works. And in some ways, the coronavirus pandemic has, uh, I think, has been a uh, has thrown that need for mm. systemic rethink for a systemic reset if you will mm. into sharper relief because it's blown into sort of sharp relief the fact that we are living in a world of such sort of deep inequality of deep unfairness and we need to have um you know radical solutions that can um that can fix that can, can reverse mm. some of these really worrying trends we see around the world and where do you see the momentum at the moment is the momentum with humanity that is seeking to save itself, that humanity that is is seeking to ensure a fairer and a better and a more equitable future and to arrest, you know, the the incredible, devastating uh, changes to the environment, or are, for want of a better term, the forces of darkness, you know, still uh, the forces of money uh, and human greed, are they actually still the dominant um, dominant features are we winning or are we losing uh, that's a fantastic <laughs> question i don't i don't know the answer to that because I, but i do agree with you that there is a it does feel like the stakes are higher than than they've been for a long time perhaps higher than ever because you know the sort of the the greed based short term shareholder first model of capitalism that we've seen in the last few decades um really could cost us the the earth um and so the stakes of those powers of sort of darkness as you describe them winning are are dramatic for everyone for everything that um that we want for future generations but on the other hand i am inspired by how quickly we seem to be raising the sort of collective consciousness around some of these issues that, um, you know, even in my lifetime, we've gone from, from, you know, the environment being, as you said, right at the start, you know, being about a bit about recycling here or recycling there mm. to really radically rethinking how the global economy works and, and there to be, you know, greater momentum. It's not just the brave activists that we see in the film that are that are making these arguments these days. You know, we're seeing corporate leaders saying, "We, you know, our our companies will not exist if there are, you know, if there isn't a, a functioning global economy. Uh, you know, jobs won't exist in a dead planet." And so the the sort of the diverse coalition of people and actors who are coming together to think about what a just sustainable world could look like or should look like is growing. And, and so is the sort of speed of, of, of that resistance, if you want to call it that. And, uh, you know, that, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an eternal optimist, I as I suspect mm. you are as well, Vaughan. And mm. that, you know, that's the belief that we have to proceed on because we can't afford to lose on this one. Um, and, you know, that, and I suppose within it also, again, coming back to the sort of COVID moment or the post COVID moment, to really think about what does a just recovery look like? Um, one that allows you know, the planet to flourish, but one that also allows every human being to live a dignified uh, existence on this planet. Um, I think there are some really important fundamental questions we have to ask about how the world works at the moment. Um, and the answer to me, yeah, it lies in, in some sort of radical shift, but li but I'm optimistic about that because, uh, you know, so many people are talking about these sorts of things and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing momentum. We, we, the, the UK is going to host the climate mm. negotiations later this year. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, even, uh, you know, our leaders here in Britain are, are making some fairly dramatic commitments around climate action. Now, we need them to put their money where their mouth is and show us how they're moving on those targets to make those targets a reality. Um, but I think even as, as recently as, say, five years ago, at the at, you know previous rounds of climate negotiations, I don't think we could have imagined that this, the sort of 
the, the change that we're seeing in at least the mm. sort of discourse around high level yeah. political action on, on, on climate. So I do think we're making progress, but there is a lot, there is a lot to lose if, if this goes wrong. So a last point, really, if, if you are somebody who is watching this film and absolutely committed to uh, wanting to, to halt climate change, uh, yet at the same time, didn't feel that you could take action on the streets, that you couldn't face going to prison if need be. That isn't the kind of person you are. What, what, would, what would you say? Well, I don't think any of the sort of protagonists in this film thought that either when at the beginning <laughs> of their own activism. And I think we see, at least amongst those people, some really powerful examples of how they stepped up and stepped into those roles and those that leadership, um, if you will. And I think I come back to where we started this discussion that it, this is in each of us. You know, Gandhi didn't know, Rosa Parks didn't know, Martin Luther King didn't know, Greta Thunberg didn't know at the start of their journey of the, into activism, where they would end or where they would be going. And I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a journey that each of us needs to, to take. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this is, a, th this is a moment where we all need to, to think about our actions. I mean, one, for me, one of the most powerful lines in that film was someone talking about, you know, getting involved in this because he didn't want his children in 20 years time to look back on family photos and ask why he had f taken a, a plane to go to Hawaii to see coral reefs that were now no longer um, alive. Um, and I thought that was a really powerful way of, um, of, of, of explaining both, that, both forms of activism. Huh? So one is around changing consumption behaviors or holiday patterns, if you will. And the other is about leading to this sort of, this more um, determined, full-time act immersive activism if you will and I think it doesn't matter to me where each of us um, mm. sort of lands on that journey but as long as we're asking ourselves what more could I be doing what more should I be doing I think that's what really matters. And for every Gandhi and Martin Luther King there are hundreds thousands of people who are inspired by them and who take small actions and begin to be part of a movement. It isn't a movement if it's just made up of leaders, which I think is also a really uh, important point. Danny, thank you so much. I think this um, has been very illuminating and very inspiring for, for me to be able to, to engage with you in this way. And uh, I am sure that people watching as well will, will find a lot of food for thought in, in your contribution to this. And so on behalf of Union Chapel, thank you very much. And I hope it won't be the last time that uh, we're able to hear your contribution. So thank you. Thanks very much.